So what did we do last time? Introduction to the course. So we're doing two major topics this quarter, differential and integral calculus. We're going to start with differential calculus because that came first in the course title. But also because it, it really helps to understand integral calculus. So the question in differential calculus is, tends to be along this line. We're given a function. Y is a function of x. Now this function can be modeling something. We might have a very popular example, uh, distance driven, where x is time in hours and y is how far you've driven. But it can be other interesting things. We did, for instance, the amount of gallons in a tide pool, where again, it was time, was the x variable. But time doesn't have to be x. You don't have to use time as your x coordinate. You can really use anything you want. So in economics, you might have uh, supply and demand. So you might have things like dollars and quantities. X might be your dollars or X might be the quantity. So don't limit yourself just to thinking this is all about functions where we measure in time. It can be really arbitrary. And in fact, most of the time we won't even worry about units. We'll just say it's just some abstract function. Okay. So we're given our function. And the question is how fast is Y changing at a point X equals A? So I fix some point A. Here's my function Y equals F of X. How fast is it changing? Well, we know something about lines. And the, the big secret about calculus that we talked about last time is that we study curved things by flat things. So this function y equals f of x, this is a curved thing. We want to study it by these flat things, which are the tangent lines. And so we know for lines how to find rate of change. That's very easy. You find your slope. And so if we can find this tangent line, and the idea of a tangent line is we, we touch. So that's where tangent is touch. Tangent lines, we use the slope of the tangent lines, we can answer our question. Now, one thing I didn't go over yesterday, but I should at least draw on the board just so everybody has the same picture in their mind. This is something that hopefully you all know anyway, so it'll be kind of redundant. Is what do the slopes look like? So if I draw a flat line, what slope is that? Yeah, this is slope zero. If I draw a line that's going uphill as I go, I'm going to get a darker pen, that goes uphill as I go from left to right, what can you tell me about that slope? Yeah, so this is a slope which is positive. What if I draw one like this? It's really positive, really big positive. And of course, it can get bigger and bigger. Now, if I go downhill as I go from left to right, what is that slope? Yeah, so slope is negative. And of course, this is a really large negative slope. So it's a really big negative number. And the vertical line, well, it depends upon who you ask. Someone might say infinity. Uh, you could say negative infinity. Probably it's just best to say vertical line. Usually we won't deal with these. But they can show up from time to time. OK. So this is just. In case you've forgotten, just remember how the slopes work. Because slopes are going to be really important. They're going to be the first couple weeks of our class. It's trying to understand slopes. And so we need to make sure that we understand zero slope means a flat, positive slope going uphill, negative slope going downhill. So for instance, in this tangent line, we can just look at it and say it has positive slope. Even without knowing what the slope is, we can say it's, it's positive slope. And we'll go learn more about this later on in the course. Okay. All right, so we know we want to find tangent lines. And we know we want to find the slopes of those tangent lines. OK. So now we have a clear goal. We know what we're looking for. But we have a problem. And the problem is that tangent lines are hard to find. And the reason that they're hard to find is what do we know about them? Well, really, we know one thing for sure is that they touch the function at the point we're interested in. Well, that's one piece of information. But tangent lines need two, either two points or a point and a slope. Well, why can't we use their slope? Well, we don't know their slope. If we knew their slope, we wouldn't even be bothering with this. So we just don't have enough information to find tangent lines. OK. Well, if we can't find our tangent lines, what can we do? Well, we find something that's easy. It's a, it's a really popular trick in mathematics. If you can't do a hard thing, do something related that's easier and hopefully work your way up. So our solution is secant lines. And secant lines are easy to find. And what's a secant line? 
Well, instead of just touching at two points, what I, sorry, instead of touching at one point, I'm going to actually touch the curve at two points. I'm not really touching, I'm actually going to cross. And I know now two pieces of information. Namely, I know this piece of information, because I know the coordinate is a f of a. And I know this piece of information, this is b f of b. Now I have two points, and so the slope here is simply the rise, which is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And this is what we call the average rate of change. In other words, what would you have to be if you were just having a constant rate of change to start at this point, a f of a, and up at that point, b f of b, that's the average. When we're looking for slopes of tangent lines, these are the instantaneous rate of change. How fast is it changing at that exact moment? So the moral is, computing these average rate of change are very easy. But we want the tangent lines. We don't want the secant lines. So what do we do? Well, our idea is pretty simple. We know what line we want. We want the tangent line. We have the secant line. How do we make the secant line be a better approximation for the tangent line? Well, what we do is we move this point closer. So in other words, as we move a B closer to A, as we move B closer to A, the, the secant line that we draw will be a better and better approximation to the tangent line. And we move this idea of being closer and closer to get better and better approximation, which leads us into the scary word that scares all calculus students, gives them nightmares, limits. <coughs> all right. So that is where we are. We're going to be talking about limits. Now, this picture over here, we're going to basically forget about it for the next lecture and a half. And we're going to come back to this and start again next week. Next week is when we really start doing derivatives, and that's what this is, what all this finding tangent lines is about. Okay, so we need to talk about limits. So what's the idea behind limits? Well, the problem here, of course, is I'd like to just plug in A. And then I would say, well, of course, that would be the best approximation of all, because I, I want to know what happens as B gets close. say, well, just plug in A. Well, if I plug in A, we get the dreaded 0 over 0 if B equals A. And as we pointed out last time, 0 over 0 is undefined. Not necessarily because it doesn't exist, but because it's an ambiguous quantity. It can really be anything we want. Well, if it can be anything we want, we need to figure out what should it be. So that is what limits are. So limits vaguely are, so I'll, let me write down the notation. Limit x goes to c g of x equals l. So this is our notation. And I'll just put a little box around it. And now I'll put a star by it, because it's really important, because we're talking about it for two lectures. And I'll put another star by because this is everything calculus is built on. And then I'll put a third star just because things, good, things that are good come in groups of three. Okay, so this is really important, this idea of limits. Now, what is it? Well, vaguely it's as x gets close to c, that's this part right here. x gets close to c, that's what that's saying. Then g of x, the function g of x, gets close to L. So I'm interested to know what happens to this function as x is getting close to c. So in this case, I'd be saying, well, what happens to this function as b is getting close to a, for instance? And of course, there's fun ways to read this. So, so if you saw this, you would read this as the limit as x goes to c of g of x equals L. Um, now, the book tells us that we should skip various things, but I, I think it's good to at least write down the, the formal definition. Because it's, it's nice to just sort of see how our, our foundation is firm, you know. When, when Newton developed calculus, it looked a lot different than what we have nowadays. He didn't have all these limits. Limits came much later. 
he used a different idea. He used this idea of like an infinitesimal, a quantity that was so small that it was there, but not there. And the problem was, it worked great. It got all the right answers, but of course it was completely bogus. Um, so they had to come up with a foundation. So this was the foundation. So the technical definition was, we say that for all epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero, so that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta, then the absolute value of g of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, that's the formal definition to say luminous x goes to c if g of x equals l. I just want to mention a few things. So this is kind of scary, but here's the trick to understanding this. What is absolute value? Now, of course, when you were, you were raised up, when you were a youngin, you were taught absolute value is, well, that's really simple. I just take the number. If it's positive, I leave it alone. If it's negative, I just make it positive, just switch the sign. That's what absolute value is. Not really. Actually, what is absolute value? Absolute value is a measurement of distance. That's what absolute value is. So here it's saying something about distance. And so that's why you notice that we use these words close here. All it's really saying is it's translating the word close into absolute value signs, which is just saying the distance. So this says, if I'm close, the, so absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. So the distance between x and c is small. It's less than some small number. Then the difference between the function g of x and this limiting value is small. And I can make it as small as I want as long as I guarantee I'm close enough to c. Now you might notice something here. I have a zero less than. What does that tell you? Well, that tells us that we don't want to have x equals c. Because at x equals c, we might have something that's gibberish. So what are limits doing? Here's how I like to do it. So limits tell us what should happen based on what is happening nearby. So in other words, I look close to my point C. And I say, OK, looking close to C, what does my function g of x look like? What value is it close to? Well, it should be getting close to L. And as I get closer and closer to C, so in other words, I, I keep looking nearby. What's happening to my function g of x? So for limits, you don't care what happens far away. And far away is a relative term. It can mean 0.1 or 0.001. Or it can mean a million. You only care what happens right near the point you're interested in. The should says, well, at x equals c, we don't care what g of x is doing. We don't want to know what it actually does. We want to know what it is that it should do. So we did an example in class last time where we did the function g of x equals sine x over x. And we said, well, there's a problem here at x equals 0. And we said, well, what happens as we go towards 0 of sine x over x? So in other words, what should the function be? And what we did was we made a chart. And I won't reproduce a chart just because you already have it in your lecture notes. And it's in the book, too. But we looked at the chart and said, OK, well, the numbers here are getting closer and closer to 1. So a natural guess is that it should equal 1. And in fact, that's the correct answer. So one thing we could do is we could do some numerical approximations where we punch in numbers and we get the numbers. So maybe C is 0 in our case. So I could choose x as 0.1, 0.01, 0 0.001. Of course, here it doesn't really matter whether which direction I come from. So I could choose also negative numbers, negative 0.05 negative 0.002. Another way to do this, besides just doing numerical approximations, is to plot a picture. So sine x over x, what does sine x over x look like? 
Well, if you plot the picture, it looks something like this. Now, how do I know that? Well, because I asked the computer to draw it for me before I came to class today. And the computer, computer drew it. And in fact, computers are really good at this. They're so good at it that when they draw the picture, they won't show that there's a hole missing. But there is a hole missing because at zero, it's undefined. Sine of zero over zero is undefined. So our graph has a hole. And the question is, can we fill the hole in? Well, yes, because we know what should happen. We know that as x goes to 0 sine x over x, I should be getting out the value 1. So what I can do is I can actually make this function nice where I fill this hole in. Now, not every function has a limit. So we should do an example where a limit doesn't exist. Ah, what are all these things? We don't want these. OK. Ah, now, of course, I don't put chalk up here. OK, so we saw sine x over x. We believe it has a limit. We'll prove it has a limit next time. We got, we'll actually give a nice rigorous proof. Well, rigorous in the sense of as rigorous as our class will get. All right. So let's look at something where a limit doesn't exist. Suppose I look at the limit as x goes to 0 of sine 1 over x. Now, we can actually draw this picture. First off, what does sine x look like? Well, that has a nice sinusoidal shape. Just regularly up, down, up, down, repeats itself for every 2 pi. So this is sine x. Well, what does sine 1 over x do? Well, essentially what it's trying to say is that if you think about it, if I come over here to where 1 is, well, 1 is probably somewhere, let's see, where would 1 be? Probably about here. At this part of the function here, for sine x, where will it end up at? Well, everything that gets larger than 1 here, when I look at 1 over x, it becomes smaller than 1. So in other words, all this, when I look at sine 1 over x, it's going to try to fit into that little tiny slot there. And notice how many times do I oscillate up and down here. It rhymes with schminfinity. That's right, it's infinity, yes. See, it's oscillating infinitely many times when I look at this x past 1. So when I look at the sine 1 over x curve, things get really bad. And it looks something like this. I come in, and then I start oscillating, and then we go through a couple pieces of chalk, because there's actually infinitely many oscillations here. And then, of course, at 0 it's undefined, because 1 over 0 is undefined, so sine 1 over 0 is, is undefined too. And then it comes out the other side, so something like that, roughly speaking. So here's my graph of sine 1 over x. Now, what happens to this as x goes to 0 of sine 1 over x? Do I approach a number? Now, remember, here we're trying to say that the limit as x goes to some point c, in our case 0, of a function is a number. Think of L as a quantity. So this is a number. So to say that we're getting close to the number means we have to be getting close to a specific fixed value. And if we're getting close to a specific fixed value, it means we can't be getting close to anything else. So is there any value where as we go towards zero, we only get close to that one value and nothing else? And the answer is no. In fact, what's happening is I'm getting close to every value between positive 1 and negative 1. Because I'm just going to keep going up and down and up and down. Now, I can make a chart, make this even more explicit. Here's x, here's sine 1 over x, and I can put in some numbers. For instance, if I choose x as pi, what is the function going to be equal to? 
So just flip this over again, sine of pi. Remember my trick, remember zero, one are on the board, so this is one of those times when that still applies. Sine of pi is? Okay, it's not one, okay, so let's eliminate that one. Zero, zero very good, okay. Sine of pi is, is zero. But one was a very good guess. You had a one in three chance of being right. How about one over two pi? Zero. How about one over three pi? And in fact, I can do one over n pi, where n is some integer value. And if I do that, what number do I get out? Zero. So just looking at those numbers, I say, well, wait a second, hold on. I kept plugging numbers that get closer and closer to zero, and I, I kept getting zero out. But of course, I was very sneaky. So this is the problem with just doing numerical calculations, because they might be deceiving you. So, because what I'm doing is I'm just picking out these points here. So of course they're going to zero, because I rigged it up so it would go to zero. But if I had chosen different points, so x sine 1 over x. OK, how about if I choose 2 over pi? What is that going to be? OK, still so same rule applies. 0, 1 are on the board. 1, yes, so that's right, because flip, flip that. Because remember, we look at 1 over x. So 2 over pi becomes pi halves. Sine of pi halves is 1. So, so I would recommend you make sure you know the basic angles. Uh, at least 0, pi halves, pi, 2 pi. At least know those for, for your sine and cosine. OK, what if I look at 2 over 5 pi? Okay, this one's not probably so fast to do in your head. It's 1. OK. How about 2 over 9 pi? It's 1. OK. How about if I look at a number that looks like 2 times 4n plus 1 times pi? 1. So when I, what I'm doing now is I'm doing the same trick, except instead of looking at these points along here, I'm, I'm just putting off the top points. Now here, it looks like I should go to 0. And here it looks like I should go to 1. Now the problem is that if I have a limit, I have to be going to a single number. And 0 and 1 aren't next to each other. There's space between them. So we can conclude that this limit does not exist. Because it's not approaching a single value. Now, of course, we could have something different going on. Let's look at another limit that doesn't exist. And this one will come up probably later on in the course. So let's look at the limit as x goes to 0 of the absolute value of x divided by x. Well, I like to, before I jump in, I like to sort of think about this function. Now, of course, I kind of gave away the ending. The limit doesn't exist, but now it's for a slightly different reason. So with a sine 1 over x, limit doesn't exist because as I go to 0, I'm actually not approaching a single fixed value. I'm approaching sort of this whole range of values between negative 1 and 1. Here, something a little bit different is going on. So before we answer that question, let's think about what can we say about the absolute value of x over x. What possible values can it be? Well, suppose I choose x as a positive number. 5. 5 is positive. If I plug it in, what do I get? I get the absolute value of 5 over 5. Of course, the absolute value of 5 is simply 5. So when x is positive, the absolute value signs don't do anything. And it really looks like x over x. So that simplifies to 1. So when x is positive, it's 1. Now what happens if x is negative? Well, when x is negative, OK, so I, I, I told you the hard thing about absolute value of x is a distance. But we can also remember, if it's negative, switch the sign. OK, so if it's negative, really the absolute value essentially will switch the sign. 
So I'll have a negative x over x. And that simplifies to negative 1. And that's if x is less than 0. And of course, if it equals 0, we have the big question mark. In other words, it's undefined. So we can draw the picture here. So for x greater than 0, it's at 1. And I stop at x equals 0, and I put an a empty circle. And the empty circle basically just says it's not defined to be this value at x equals 0. A field in circle says I'm, I'm defining it to be this value at, at x equals 0. So this is 1. And then negative 1 is down here. And it looks like that. OK, so what happens to this function as we take the limit as x goes to 0? Yeah, it's going towards two different numbers. If I look at the right-hand side, which are the positive numbers, it looks like I should be getting 1. If I look at the left-hand side, which are the negative numbers, I look like I should get negative 1. And the problem is that 1 and negative 1 don't match. So when you get different things, different values from the two sides, the limit doesn't exist. Because it has to approach a single fixed number. Now we can say, well, the, sure, the limit doesn't exist. But I can really think of it as two pieces. I can think of it as a left piece and a right piece. So this does not exist. So there's something called a one-sided limit. And that basically says, I don't want to come from both directions. So a limit, when I say here, if we go back to the definition of limit, I say as x is close to c, but I don't put a restriction on saying that x is close to c from above it or x is close to c from below it. So I really have to say x is close to c from either direction. It doesn't matter. Well, I can, I can change this and add some more restrictions. And so we have these one side limits. And so there's some notation here. There's this notation. There's this notation. So we put either a minus or a plus after the C. And this says, so you look at the limit as x, whoops, as x goes to C from the left or if you like, the negative side of C. So this one, not surprising. This is the limit as x goes to C from the right, or if you like, the positive side. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to remember. You know, it's like that song. From the left, from the left, the minus sign means you go from the left. See? <laughs> exactly. All right. So, so when you see in the homework, you see a minus or a plus afterwards, that's not a misprint. It's not a typo. It's saying that you restrict your, your limit so you're coming from either one side or the other. So for instance, here, our limit doesn't exist because when we came from the two sides, we got different numbers. But if we look at the one side limits, they do exist. So if I go from 0 minus absolute value of x over x, so in other words, I now look on the left-hand side, I don't care what happens on this side. It doesn't exist to me anymore. I only care what's happening over here. And when I look at it, I say, well, it's pretty easy to see what happens. I'm always negative 1. So the limit will be negative 1. On the other hand, if I look at the limit as x goes to 0 from above, absolute value of x over x. Again, now it's the other side. I don't care what happens on this side. My world, as far as I'm concerned, is just on what happens for x bigger than 0. And when I look at x bigger than 0, well, it's very easy to understand. It's this nice function 1. And as x goes to 0, I see that I get 1. So let me just point out, if the two one side limits 
exist but don't agree, the limit doesn't exist. If they do agree, the limit does exist, and it's just whatever number they agree on. OK. Let's see. So let's see if we can draw some pictures just practicing this. So maybe we have a function that maybe does the same thing as sine 1 over x to there at 0. We do this. Come in. OK, let's say this is at 2. Up here is 3. This is at 1. This is at 1 again. Here is 2. Let's say this is at 2, even though my picture is obviously wrong. OK. Suppose our function were to look like this. So we can just sort of graphically just make sure we have our intuition correct. And this is our function. Let's say y equals g of x. What is the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x? So here's 1. So I want to say, OK, what's happening to my function as I get close to 1? So what's happening to it? Yeah, uh, my function is getting closer to this value here. They're both coming in towards here. What is this value? It's 1. But notice, what is g of 1? It's 3. Now, we'll have a name for this in our next lecture. We call this discontinuous. But the important thing to remember is that limits tell us what should happen. The function says, I really think it should be 1. It doesn't tell us what does happen. Because the actual function says, no, I'm just messing with you. I'm really 3. <coughs> so remember, limits tell us what, what should happen, not what does happen. OK, how about what's the limit as x goes to 0 of g of x? Well, be careful here. What kind of limit am I looking at? If I'm not specifying here, I'm really looking at the limit from both sides, from below and from above 0. So if I'm looking from above and below 0, I need to make sure that everything matches up. Then I can say the limit exists. Now, from above 0, I'm definitely getting 2. That's, that's clear. What's happening, though, from below 0? Well, it's the same problem. Again, it's not approaching 2. It's just doing this infinite oscillation up and down. So it's not approaching a set value. So therefore, what about this limit? Yeah, it does not exist. But as we just mentioned, if I restrict it so it's a one side limit from above, then it does exist, and it's equal to 2. And similarly, we can do other things. OK, so that's just some examples. I think you might have a homework problem. Similar to that in nature. OK. Let's see. One side limits. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. OK. So one other type of limit, then we'll just write down a bunch of rules. So far, our functions have been pretty nice. But we can have some strange things happen. Suppose I look at my function y equals 1 over x squared. Let me get a, sorry, that does it not write very well. And I say, well, what's the limit as x goes to 0 of my function 1 over x squared? Now, we probably know what 1 over x squared looks like. At least it's not hard to convince ourselves. It looks something like that. So now, in this case, this is an 
this is an example of what we call an infinite limit. So our book will decide to say this is infinity. Now, you have to be really careful here because infinity, this is not a number. Some people like to think of infinity as like a really big number, you know, like a trillion or, or uh, you know, even bigger than that. I have a, a colleague who's down at UC San Diego. He holds the world record for the largest number used in a mathematical proof. And it's so big, they had to come up with a new notation just to signify how big it was. It's unbelievably big. And it, it's, it's an upper bound. And the lower bound is 13. Uh, so, but even that number is not even close to infinity. Um, so essentially when we say it's infinity, what we really mean to say is the idea is that it grows and becomes unbounded. In other words, no matter what number you give me, it gets larger than that, and it stays larger than that. So if I say, well, what about 100? Does it get above 100? Well, yeah, it gets above 100, and in fact, it's easy to check that at x equals 0.1 is when I hit 100, and from there on, I'm above 100. Well, I could say, how about a million? Sure, I can say above a million. x equals 0.001. How about a trillion? So forth and so on. So when we say it's infinity, it just means basically it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, so be careful with infinity. Don't treat infinity like other numbers. Because it doesn't behave like other numbers. For instance, what's infinity plus 1? It's infinity. How about what's 2 times infinity? Infinity. What's infinity minus infinity? Undefined. Because again, it's the same problem as with 0 divided by 0. Infinity minus infinity is ambiguous because it could be anything. And in fact, as you go on next quarter, you'll learn, hopefully, they'll teach it to you, something called the hospital's rule, or the French would call it le hôpital. <laughs> and, and one of the things that you'll learn about is dealing with the situation when you have infinity minus infinity. It's, it's the same way that you deal with 0 over 0. Okay, but basically, Whenever we see an asymptote, a vertical asymptote where we explode up, we have infinity. Uh, we might have where one side blows up and the other side doesn't. That's okay. It's just intuitively, I think you know what's going on, so that's all I'll say about that. Because I want to finish up by writing just a couple of rules. And the moral of the story is that limits basically do everything that we expect them to do. Of course, we can't just say that. We have to write everything down, and that's going to take us the remaining six minutes of class. OK, so first off, if I take the limit as x approaches c of a constant k. So in other words, k has nothing to do with x. It's just a constant. What should it be? It should be k. Because k, is, it's, no matter when I look at it, it looks like k. So as x is close to c, it, it still looks like k. No big surprise. How about if I look at the limit as x goes to c of x? Yes. In other words, as x gets close to c, x gets close to c. Not very profound, and that's what that says. All right, suppose now the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l, and I'm not infinite, so I'm going to throw that out just because I don't want to deal with that. Those are headaches. And again, when was x approaches c, g of x equals m, not infinite. The important thing here is just to say the limits exist and they're numbers. Well, one thing I can do is, what ha happens, excuse me, if I look at the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus g of x, what would you expect to be true? Well, really, if f is getting close to l and g is getting close to m, then f plus g should be getting close to l plus m. 
And another way to say that is, is what I can do is I can break up over the addition. So when I have a limit of sums, if the individual pieces have a limiting value, and they're nice, then I just take the limit of each piece and I combine the results. OK. How about if I look at the limit as x approaches c of a constant k times f of x? So f is getting close to l. So what should k times f be getting close to? k times l. I mean, that's the intuition, and it's not very hard to show that. In fact, that's exactly what happens. That's k times the limit as x goes to c of f of x. So in other words, I can pull constants out. Now, these two facts alone basically make what limits are. Uh, it says it's linear. Don't worry about that. If you go on and you, you become math majors, you'll say, aha, I remember. Professor Butler said linear one time in class. And it'll click. If you're not becoming math majors, don't worry about that word. But you should all become math majors. We have the number one ranked occupation. All right. OK. How about if I look at limit as x goes to c f of x times g of x? What would you expect it to be true? F's getting close to l. G's getting close to m. If I multiply them together, what should it be getting close to? Oh, it should be getting close to l times m. So again, I can break it up into pieces. All right. Let me write down two more. OK, now let's suppose that m is not 0. So in other words, that this limit doesn't go to a, a 0 number. And why do we want to avoid that? Well, as you can probably guess, I want to do some division. So what happens if I look at the limit of f of x over g of x? Well, as long as the denominator is not going to 0, then you're fine with just saying, well, look, take the limit of the top and divide it by the limit of the bottom. OK, so essentially, everything that's here on the board says limits do what we think they should do. No big surprise. And let me just mention that if f of x is a polynomial. So what's a polynomial? Well, it looks like f of x looks like something like a n x n, where a n is some number, plus a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, all the way down to a1 times x plus a0. So essentially, it's some linear combination of powers of x. So these are, are the functions that we like to study because we think we understand them. And, and we do pretty much understand them. Then the limit, as x approaches c of f of x, is f of c. So in other words, if you have a polynomial, to find the limit, it's ridiculously easy. You just plug in the number that you're, you're interested in. So if limit as x goes to c of f of x equals l. Oh, sorry, equals a function. So why is that? Well, let's just do an example. Suppose I want to look at the limit as x goes to 1 of 3x squared plus 2x. Now, what does the rule say? What should it be? It should be just plug your 1 in. So in other words, for polynomials, what we get is what, what we expect to get is what we actually do get. So we plug in 1, you get 5, right? Let's just quickly run through our rules. This rule says I can break up over addition. And this rule says I can pull out constants. So combining those two rules, I'll, I'll do it in two quick steps here. So I, I have limit of 3x squared plus the limit of 2x. Well, and then I pull out the constants. Now, this I can think of as x times x. So this is the limit as x goes to 1 of x times the limit as x goes to 1 of x plus 2 times the limit as x goes to 1 of x. And now, what do we know about the limit as x goes to 1 of x? 
that's this row right here. It says you just plug in the number. So we get 3 times 1 times 1, or 3 times 1 squared, plus 2 times 1, lo and behold, 5. And essentially the same argument shows that for any polynomial, the limit is what you should get when you plug in the point. It's just apply the rules over there. All right, have a good day. I'll see you on Friday. If you don't have a syllabus yet, they're over here. And I'll have office hours this afternoon. <laughs>